my name is Rupert Hollier. Um, I run a company called Red5 Creative, and I'm going to be your pilot for the day. Navigate through the choppy waters of trailers with my esteemed panel, Kristen, Vikram, and Gary. Um, I thought what we would do, we'll try and keep it a bit open. We're going to have some Q&As at the end, but if you have a question that you need to ask right on the moment that something has sparked into your brain, do it. We've got some people going around with microphones, so they'll be able to come and make you feel like you're on Jeopardy or whatever. Um, I thought the best way to start is to let the guys blow their own trumpets, tell you a little bit about what they do, who they are, and also some big successes that they may have had recently, so you get a grip on what they're doing. We'll then play a couple of clips, and then I'm going to look at my phone loads to remember my notes and try and get some good answers out of these guys. So let's start with Kristen. First up, always. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Kristen Agee. I'm based in Los Angeles. I run a company called 411 Music Group. Um, we basically do three different things. I come from a composing background, so I'm a classical violinist, bassist, went to sound engineering school, used to record 80s punk bands in my first LA studios, and then um, started writing full time, and after that started ultimately aggregating music, um, specifically for synchronization. So I was signing artists to one-stop deals, publishing and master side. Um, I built an underscore catalog, sound design, trailer music catalog, started sub-publishing, co-publishing various US catalogs and international catalogs, and then started a commercial publishing side where we do sign artists and writers to traditional sort of pub publishing writing deals, set up co-writing um, and songwriting camps. And then we do custom music. So I head up all of our custom music. We scored probably like 10 TV shows last year um, in LA, and we do a lot of work in London and have different offices in various territories. And, and we do a little bit of music supervision if we need to, but that's not our main gig. Voila, thank you for having me. <laughs> um, hi, my name's uh, Vikram Gudi, or Vic. Um, I run uh, mainly Elephant Music, um, which is, um, I suppose you call it a premium uh, library that specializes in, in trailer music. Uh, we have composers from all over the world. Um, it actually started out representing bands and, uh, for film and TV and then started to get a lot of success with our piano stuff. And then we sort of, in the last four years, went straight into the trailer world. Um, we also do custom music. Um, I also run a company called Split Music Publishing. We're a commercial music publisher. Uh, we specialize in uh, industrial techno, uh, classical, neoclassical composers, um, and quite a lot of just experimental weird stuff. Uh, and we try and find a home on film and TV, um, but it ends up on trailers mostly because we just find trailers take more of a risk in that world. Um, and I recently launched Mammoth Audio, uh, which is uh, a VST plugin company. So it's more on the music technology side. Done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello, my name's. Is that on? Hello, my name's Gary Seeger. I work for uh, Peer Music. Um, I'm a creative director. I've been with the company since 2016. My background's pretty much publishing and uh, music supervision. I also um, still work on the music supervision side of things. Uh, Peer Music uh, is one of the oldest independent publishing companies. Uh, it's now got, I think, 30 offices globally. Uh, we just picked up Music Cube. Um, obviously, a lot of strength uh, from uh, Latin music. And my main job is is finding music, uh, finding um, uh, the right music to to work with all the production um, people that I that I work with uh, in film and TV. Um, both whether that that as a music supervisor or wearing wearing my peer hat. Thank you, guys. So you can see that a lot of bases are covered with this crew. There's a lot of stuff, and no one is one-dimensional, thankfully. We would bring you nothing less. Um, before we do a couple of the clips, can we have a little show of hands just so we know who's here? So are there any managers in the audience? Artists? Music soups? Publishers? Labels? So you all know about music then. All right. Anyone get involved with trailers? Licensing or whatever, okay, all right, so you kind of get the gig. Um, in that case, without further ado, let's start with Kristen's clip, which is? Uh, this is the latest 
season of Game of Thrones trailer. You have to protect it. Come to my family. It's all because I couldn't love a motherless child. You are a Stark. You might not have my name, but you have my blood. Wow, wow, wow. And goodbye. <laughs> no. um, so, yeah, we just found out we both sort of did sound design for that. Yeah. So we didn't do the score, obviously, like that's the theme um, for the show. Um, and we didn't trailerize it or anything like that. So we didn't do any of the music, we just did sound design. Um, so part of our music catalog is a sound design catalog, which is an interesting sort of thing to be in, especially for producers, DJs, um, writers who are creating their own noises and sounds and whatever. So we have albums of hits, drops, risers, like all of these different like builds. Um, and, and basically like all of our catalog and specifically that sound design catalog lives at all the trailer houses we work at. So they, we give them our hard drives of our catalog. They take it, they either keep our hard drive or upload it into their systems and their servers and then use it as they need to. So this was one of those cases, they took an existing just sound design element from our catalog um, and popped it in where it needed to be and did a license and that was that, so. Yeah, they do, a lot of the time, the tool, they call it toolkits, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. S yeah. You had it in, in there also? Yeah, no, I just had like, it's, it's crazy how it works. Like I just had like a swish hit, which is basically whoop, Yeah. And we had like a boom. Yeah, you get a, <laughs> you get a license for that somehow. Yeah, and it's actually like, a, it's an interestingly, like really lucrative business just doing sound design. Um, we've done sound design for like the Ghost in the Shell trailer. That one's probably, I mean, this is interesting because it's relevant now and everyone freaks out about Game of Thrones, but for the sound design first uh, Ghost in the Shell that came out a couple years ago, the whole first half of the trailer is sound design elements. There's no music in it at all. So you have to, they had to build the whole trailer with just sound design for the first minute and a half or minute, like after a minute in the music comes in. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of an interesting trailer to look at because of that, because it's not just led by music, it's led by sound design that is created by artists, writers, musicians, our DJs, our, you know, electronic producers. Um, so that was, that's a cool one too. But. Yeah, it is. It's crazy lucrative. Like, um, I never thought that, you know, like the fees would be that good, but uh, to put it in perspective, I've been paid more for a, a bit of three seconds of sound design on a... TV spot, not even, you know, full trailer, than I have for some UK TV adverts. Yeah. Like, the budget's vary so much that you just never know what you're going to get. There's a little bit of the Wild West, isn't there? And we were talking about it earlier with the kind of the, the gaming trailers and all of that. I think maybe later on we're going to try and delve into the process and kind of what Kristen went through with that and, and kind of who you're talking to, because I think that's an important thing, right? When we're dealing with this, how does the music get there? What actually is that kind of magic alchemy within the edit? I mean, Kristen just alluded to kind of, if you don't mind me saying, quite it's quite a linear way and that you've, I know, God, I know that you've worked your behind off getting all of those hard drives out there doing everything, but obviously you get involved creatively. But in this instance, 
they've just been like, right, this is amazing. We know it's on the system. Yeah, totally. I mean, there was another trailer we worked on, this Live by Night trailer, the Ben Affleck like gangster movie that came out a few years ago. And I don't even know how much I can still talk about it because it wasn't ever released, this particular trailer. But in L.A., which is kind of like the main hub for trailers, um, they all the studios go to all the trailer houses and they all sort of bid against each other. So they all get paid to do it, their own version of their trailer and then they sometimes for bigger movies do audience testing or like screen it, you know, and, and people vote on what's your favorite trailer and it's like, you know, they'll spend as much in marketing if not more sometimes than a film. Um, and so all the trailer houses are sort of competing for the same job, which means they all do their own music and they all do their own cuts and they all pick their own footage. And so um, a our good friend we were just talking about, um, called me on a Friday, of course, at 4 p.m. and was like, Kristen, so we want to trailerize this Johnny Cash song, and we do not know what to do because it's a very roots, like, soul Johnny Cash, like, vocal, acoustic guitar, violin. And because I'm a violinist, he's like, we don't want it to be like this big orchestral sound and build. We want it, don't want it to be trailerized in this, the same typical way. It needs to stay true to Johnny Cash. So th can you just come in and watch this edit? Everyone's very particular about like privacy and obviously like not like it signing NDAs and all that. So I went in and, and watched this cut and I was like, okay, I get it now. And they, they, I watched it up until a point and then I was like, okay, we don't have any more footage. Like we need a track from you so that we can cut to your music. So I went home, I recorded violin stems, I sent it out to all of my composers that would work on it. And then by Monday morning, sent eight versions back of different like variations of how that could potentially work. And then they popped it in and through various revisions and sound design elements, they dropped in. It stuck in their trailer version. Ultimately, another trailer house won out the whole campaign. So it's never even released. Um, but it was an interesting sort of custom trailer job that we ended up doing that was not like a standard trailer experience, I guess. It's amazing. And we, we kind of jumped straight in. Like Sorry. really, really no, no. It's good. it's great. Really, like into the deep end because obviously something we want to we want to kind of talk through, which you might know, is the trailerization. What that means, what it is. We all know what it means. I'm sure most of you guys do. But as you can see, there's a lot of sound design involved. There is a lot of bespoke involved. Again, it's not just licensing a track that we found off a catalogue and it goes straight in. Of course, you'd expect there'd be some playing around with it in the edit to make it fit what it is. But as you can see, there is a whole industry based around it not being that you know big big ass rock pop song that you've got in your catalogue. Um, it changes with territories. Um, I know we're gonna look at Vic's clip in a minute, but I was gonna just bring Gary in. In terms of what Kristen's explaining, it's very different in Australasia, right? It's just not like that at all. Yeah, it's totally different. It's, um, we don't really have the luxury of those kind of big budgets. Uh, and as a, as a publisher or music supervisor, you're really, um, you're not passing this on to someone else. It's, it's, all, it's all part of, of, the, uh, of the contract you have with, with your client. Um, so the trailers are sometimes, well, music in general is, is, is like the 11th hour in a, with a lot of, uh, especially with TV, it's ridiculous. Uh, with the features, it's a little bit different. Um, uh, and, and with a, you know, choosing, because I'm, I'm just, coming purely from a, a licensed song. So it's still, it's still colourful and wonderful, but nowhere is, is uh, at the depth that uh, these guys are talking about. Um, and it's uh, negotiating those kind of um, figures for a trailer um, where it's necessary. It's got to be in perpetuity. It's got to be for the world because this is how um, Australian films make their money. Um, it's it's pretty it's it's tough. It's not a not an easy process. Yeah, I bet. And it's it, it is really really interesting how the different aspects of the film companies and how the film what its sales and distribution or how that affects what the trailer is and then the budget and la la la. There's a whole world which we might get into if we can extend this by like five hours. So <laughs> let's get. Can we do Vic's trailer just to jump into that and he can tell us about all his magic sauce. If you like. God, it seems like a thousand years ago. I fought my way out of that cave. Became Iron Man. Realized I loved you. I know I said no more surprises, but I was really hoping to pull off one last one. 
The world has changed. None of us can go back. All we can do is our best. And sometimes the best that we can do is to start over. All these people die. I keep telling everybody they should move on. Some do, but not us. Even if there's a small chance, we owe this to everyone who's not in this room to try. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. <laughs> oh my god really the most <laughs> the most humble placement that, you've ever had is, for sure that is a motivational um or <laughs> vignette there really isn't it i mean i need to we'll just go to my people at home and every monday morning <laughs> whatever it takes isn't that like the most viewed trailer of all time ever in the universe probably i don't know it has to be it's, I, think, I, think it, I think it was for the first 24 hours it got 200 million views or something, so for the first 24 hours. But actually, if you look at the history of, of big trailers, it's normally like the older they are, the more they get. Um, but no, it's interesting what you were saying about, like, um, I think you said every, every trailer process is different. Yeah. And that's so true. I've never had two things, you know, I've never had anything happen the same way twice. Um, so, like, Endgame was, um, we did, that's, the, that's trailer one. And there was a teaser back in November, and the editor really liked our track, and he cut our track, and he cut another track by another library, and he loved them both, and the other library won. And then he just held on to this track, and he was like, I am cutting with this track, like, I am finishing this trailer, and he did. Um, but we kind of cheated, because on Endgame, there's kind of only one, on the, on the Marvel stuff, there's only like two editors that work on it and win everything. Um, so it's kind of, if you're in with that editor, then you get a lot of the Marvel stuff. Um, but that was a custom, so we cust so we scored the whole trailer from start to finish, and it wasn't. It was long and grueling. I think we finished on version sixty-three after after four months. <laughs> what about all that sound design in the middle? Was sound is, uh, well, they made us integrate some of the sound design. So, for example, the the ending the ending was all us, and but the intro hits the big. That was another uh, toolkit from another a company. I think it was Totem, you know, the new company. Um, so again, there was probably, I mean, if you look at it, that one was probably less, but if you look at a cue sheet for a trailer, which is basically all the things that are used, the average number of companies that pop up is like 30, you know, so, hits and songs. And so this is a question I've got. How many people in that ecosystem of that trailer Without obviously, there was a lot behind the scenes, but how many people do you think were directly responsible from the production to even if the distributor had something? That, that, that's ridiculous for for Disney Marvel. I think like probably about a hundred people um, for that one. I mean, that being said, I've worked on on trailers where there's like the great ones where there's two people working on it and you're their friends and you kind of it just happens like that. But there's so many decision makers, especially the execs. And in this case, doesn't happen in a lot of trailers. Normally, it's like the pro the producer at um, at the studio. So it would be like you know Warner Brothers or Marvel uh, or Disney or you know Sony. Then it would be like the head of the trailer house and the producer at the trailer house and the music supervisors. And like that's just the first hurdles. Like there's there's so many things that can go wrong 
honestly, whenever we get a trailer, I think it's a small miracle. <laughs> so if you had to, oh, sorry, go on. No, no, I was just gonna agree. Like, it's like that Live By Night trailer we did, you know? We busted our asses to, to like, go home over the weekend and record all these custom tracks for it and give them eight versions and by Monday. And we went through lots of revisions, same thing. They dropped in their own sound design um, and ultimately their entire trailer didn't win. So if you're looking at like one trailer house making one trailer, that's one aspect of it. And then if you have every other trailer house bidding out for the exact same project making their own trailer version, you know, which in these mass massive movies, they're all doing that. So then you're doing audience testing. It's a it's, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's good and bad. I mean, it's good because, like, I'd say about five or six years ago, you know, even a, a trailer like um, a movie like Endgame would have, like, it would have a teaser, then you'd have a main trailer and maybe a second main trailer and a, a few TV spots. Yeah. Like, now something like Endgame or Transformers or, you know, a big blockbuster, it will have, like, five main trailers and then, like, up to 50 TV spots. And each TV spot needs sound design and it needs a track and it needs you know sometimes commercial tracks sometimes custom so like you can have up to like 500 music companies getting paid for one campaign of one film and that's why it's so exciting to be in trailers right now because that and that's just films you've got the same then going on for games and you know apps even have trailers now um and then that's not even not even talking about tv and the explosion of netflix and amazon who all have trailers now too so it's kind of like the best time to be in trailers even books have trailers now. <laughs> they do. They do. Books have trailers. Um, so just one question I want to ask all of you, and it's, it's very loaded, and sorry for the vague answers that you might have to give on this, but in terms of the creative, when you're working on licensing something into any kind of media's trailer, if you had to take an average of the person who is doing the most creative on that, so whether it's the composer or it's the producer or it's the editor, what do you kind of find comes out in the mix? Who's generally in the driving seat of the process? Because licensing is one thing, obviously doing bespoke is something else. As Vicar said, there's a thousand million people involved. Where do the voices meet? And, you know, I, I, think, I think it actually, it depends on who you're working with um, and whether it's a, it's a feature or it's, a, it's TV or games or whatever. But for me, um, we work very closely with the whole team, the director, producer and the editor. Um, and uh, I mean, I've, I've worked on a, um, a couple of big kind of semi-musicals, so I'm there at the very script stage. I worked on a, a movie some years ago called The Sapphires, and, uh, and it was about a, a group of um, Aboriginal girls in the 70s, a true story that they went to Vietnam and they sang to the troops. They were kind of like the, the um, Supremes kind of Australian version. Um, they'd hate for me to say that. Um, <laughs> So they, uh, so we, we had to get all that clearance, you know, at, at the very beginning because a lot of those songs were big, um, you know, they, they were soul songs, you know, Dock of the Bay, etc. Um, and so we, we worked very closely, you know, uh, uh, from a, a round table creative thing right to the, the end part of the 11th hour with the editor going, shit we can't get this song clear because we can't afford it or for some reason they've knocked it back. So for me, personally, um, it's a bit of everything that I get and, and that's how it, it works for my side. Yeah. Vic? Um, yeah, it's kind of depend on the, on the job, I suppose, but I'd probably say the editor does most of the work in, in trailers. Um, I'd like to say composers and me, but actually it's we just kind of... Well, I personally just kind of try and guess, you know, like I just make music that that I like and I sort of commission albums and work with composers and musicians I like and hopefully it clicks with someone and uh, it's not always a, the, the sort of process of like you put the album out and then someone hears it and then working on this thing and then they cut it. It's like sometimes editors can hold a track in their folder for like five years uh, for the perfect product um, project to come up and then they'll cut it. So I think for that reason, the editor should get quite a lot of the, the credit. But before the editor comes the music supervisor. And that's kind of your first filter. So it would be somewhere in between the two, I'd say. Definitely agree with that last point. Um, <laughs> Kristen, how about you? Yeah, I mean, it's, I feel like this answer could go in so many different directions. Because really, like, there's a, there's a bit of, it depends, but 
but the market sort of dictates also what people are going to end up using. So, like, you all know that the creepy cover trailer version that, like, of the big song or, like, a Lauryn Hill song or, like, an Nirv old Nirvana song that is now new creepy trailerized version, you know? So there's a bit, I think, of, like, the market and the public and, like, the, you know, at the end of the day, this is a marketing campaign for a film. So if you're thinking about marketing and your audience and what pe people are going to retain and remember and listen to and make them go watch that movie. That's what they're going to do. So if it's a, a lot of times they just want a big commercial song that everyone knows and, and maybe it's in a new way. So I think, I think it's a bit of like the audience, the market dictates all of that. And then, yeah, ultimately, you know, the producers, the music supervisors, the editors, like when I went in to do that custom job, like I sat with the editor and music supervisor and watched it and and we designed this whole track based on it but then that has to go up to like all of the you know higher ups and ultimately the heads of the studios for them to approve it and then they kick it back and they're like this sucks I'm like great i just spent like five weeks on that you know and 10 composers later but um so yeah it does depend like with artist sound design stuff everyone just has it they use it we license it it's done but of course like the process before that of creation is a whole different story so um, you know, I think you have to kind of know what you're doing on that side to create the right elements to get used, and then you have to know the right people, the right hands to put it in for them to, to try to use, and then you hope and pray that it stays and that everyone else agrees and, you know, you can, and then the trailer actually airs. The, there's so many things that can go wrong before then. Like, um, it, like I keep saying, it's a miracle when it happens. Like, you can quote, you know, you can go into the trailer house and see it cut. Everyone's kind of celebrating. And then the day it's supposed to come out, they go with a different one. It's like, it, it's, it's such a miracle when one, one actually finishes. Um, and that's why I think like, you know, you, you shouldn't take it for granted when you get win a trailer. I think you should always like celebrate and be happy for it and try and get the most out of it you possibly can. Um, but we like to drink wine every time we, we, get, we win a trailer. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Rosé all day that day. <laughs> And so we also we touched on trailerization. This is a word that the guys have mentioned a couple of times. Is that, do you guys all know what trailerization is? I'm sure you could guess, but do you understand the, the kind of concept of what it is? Is anyone aware of it and its work? Not really. So, tell him, tell him, Rue. I, I don't know. I'm here to learn. <laughs> well, so, well, uh, no, trailerization is effectively, and I, so I'm going to give you my layman's term so they can shoot me down and we can actually listen to someone who knows what they're talking about. So effectively, it's taking an existing track maybe by a big artist, extending it, pulling it apart, putting on sound effects, sound design, maybe covering it, putting a nice little explosion at the end or a resolve. I'm really demeaning it, but is that kind of... That's pretty much it. Yeah, that's All it. right. Well, yeah, you kind of... It, I mean, there's different, there's different versions of it. I mean, like, uh, there was that really awesome Smoke on the Water one that uh, came out for... Was it Aquaman? I, I'm going to get it wrong now, but... Um, it was Hellboy. And that was like... It was trailerized, but it was just like a really cool track, to be honest, that like you could probably put out in the charts and people would buy it. And then there's like the standard like creepy female vocal, small drone intro, which then becomes big and euphoric. Um, but basically it's, if you watch those two trailers that you watch, there's a structure to a trailer. There's like the introduction, there's like um, the build, then there's this resolve moment where something's revealed and then there's what's called the final third, where it, it kind of just all kicks off and it kind of re also reveals what might happen, but it doesn't let you know which way it's gonna go. And you kind of take a track and you use that formula and you apply that formula to it. I think that's kind of trailerization, right? Yeah, totally. I mean, yeah, the trailers are built on three acts, just what he said. There's beginning, middle, and end, and there's a transition, um, like a hook sort of thing, and they have different builds and, and like, stops, what we call, like, in even television, like, sting-outs, like, where it'll build, and then there'll be a kaboom, and there's, like, silence, and then it goes into the next thing, you know? I mean, they, they build this into television also, like, when we're writing, when we write underscore cues for TV shows, our like two minute, two and a half minute tracks have 45 second stops, like basically throughout the whole thing. So it's like build to here and then there's a sting out 
and then you build again and it's and then it resolves in the same sort of place that it started so that you can have multiple sting outs within one track that gives flexibility to editors if that makes sense um but but yeah trailers build in sort of a similar way and sometimes they use i guess like if you know if you're composing a picture they'll use the same track um but sometimes they use different tracks in the same trailer different you know, songs um, and like romantic comedy tra comedy trailers are different than big epic drama trailers than like minimalist sort of like French film since we're in France. Like mm -hmm. just I mean, just from a licensing point of view too, and I noticed that there's a few artists in the audience as well. Is making sure wh when you are pitching this kind of stuff um, from uh, from a contract point of view, you've got to make sure that you you are you know making. Sh covering yourself with your third parties that all this is ca that can be done you know there's one thing of just picking the song and putting it in a trailer but to to do all this kind of stuff it's 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 got to be all in the contract and from an artist's point of view having all those stems available you know and the web files making sure that that you know that all gets sent through because as soon as as soon as we clear something on on peer side we're pretty much handing over you know all the files for them because that's that's what it is these days, and, yeah, you, and, you, and sure. you know, it, it, and you just have to give, you know, hand those kind of things over. Yeah, not having stems will just lose you trailers nowadays because, like, the first thing that happens is they take an, they have an interest in your song, they ask for stems. That's kind of like the first indicator that, that you know something might happen with this track. And more often than not, even just like hard drive failures, you know, uh, a composer's like lost his hard drive on a train or it's been wiped, has lost tens of thousands of dollars um, because not having the original files is key because editors basically recut your cue the way they want it. Yeah, and there are companies that, I know there are certainly companies that do this with classical and contemporary score stems and cues, but there are companies, especially in LA, it's a big business, where they will trailerize. I know we're all thinking of the same ones, but they, you know, they are out there. They do entire albums, just taking other other people's copyrights. So you know, like Lionel Richie, Deep Purple, whatever. They'll take ten of these tracks and completely rip them apart. And these yeah. albums, they're not sold commercially, but every single track on the album will get a placement in a massive movie. So you just see the importance of this aspect of the game. I mean, certainly. As a film supervisor, I'm always asked to clear stuff for out of context use in trailers from pieces of music that are cleared for the movie. They never make it there because then the distributors get involved. They bring in specialists like these guys and this whole game starts. So it's fascinating. I think, I think there is a commercial aspect to getting your music on a trailer too because a lot of these companies that you're talking about are think, probably thinking about the same ones. If you go and look up, well, if you go and have a look at their YouTube channels, they'll upload the trailer and it will say, you know, blah, blah, cover for blah, blah, trailer. And it will be, you know, hundreds of millions of views. Uh, really hundreds of millions and the same on Spotify. And you can make money without even getting the trailer, like just having cool trailerized versions because it's becoming a trend for just music listeners now. Effectively, more people will probably end up seeing a big trailer than will actually see the film, if that makes sense, kind of worldwide or often. Probably. I was actually talking to someone earlier about it because they, they mentioned that, you know, you're going to be on this panel. And, uh, and he said, I actually watch a lot of trailers. And I think it's like everything. You know, you get caught up in YouTube, you're watching something, you're trying to search for something, and an hour goes by and you're actually way over here because <laughs> you've just found this really cool doco or something, you know. So, but yeah, he, there are people that are just watching trailers. Well, it's uh, you know the old school pleasure of going to the cinema and seeing what was coming out. Now we can see that every day in our living room. I mean, I will sit there and just watch trailers, like Gary saying, for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and then it's time for bed. So we've got about 10 minutes left. Has anyone got any kind of questions bubbling? So we've got a few, so we might eat into the 10 minutes. It's cool. Do you want to? Do you want to start? Thank you. Um, Question uh, for Vikram, you said 63 versions, four months, 100 people working, and I'm wondering whether there's room for a more efficient approach, and by that I mean, do you see artificial intelligence or a, a new technology uh, helping you, not substituting you, but helping you in getting towards your objective faster? Um, He's an anagram, by the way, you know that. <laughs> uh, 
Me personally, no, um, because no matter what happens, the, the 63 versions, um, the decision process um, of all the people is always going to be the same. You're always going to have a hierarchy in a studio and each cut is going to have to be approved by that, that many people. And each time it comes back and rejected, a composer is still going to have to edit that. So for me, m probably not. But in that hierarchical process of the studio, possibly. But I can't imagine artificial intelligence making a creative decision uh, when you're talking about a movie that costs $1.4 billion. Like, you can't really risk that. Um, that's, that's what I'm assuming the... I'll go on then. <laughs> no, I think no, it's true. I mean, when it comes to creative process, it's uh, it, we're we're a long way away from that kind of thing. Look, I'm sure at some point it's going to happen, you know. But uh, it's I think what you're trying to say too is like surely you can streamline this a little bit, you know, and save all the all the grey hairs and the headaches and the and the copious wine drinking <laughs> of success but it's you know you're dealing with a lot of different creatives you're dealing with a lot of chiefs and they all have their own opinion and you, somehow you've got to hypnotize the chickens you know yeah i think it's just there's just a lot of money involved is, is the is the truth of it and you know you can't take risks you can't put that decision in one person's hand because it's too much responsibility for one person so you have to have these sort of safety nets for people to fall back on um i, I guess I'm sure you know there are companies that do, they have little algorithms that will create AI scores for entire movies, but this is like, this is a, a kind of a cheap version at the moment. Well, didn't the first algorithm get signed to a major label recently? I think so, yeah. Yeah. That's right. it's Warner just, Records, right? Yeah, it was classical, wasn't it? Yeah. Classical yeah. It's coming. They are, they are coming. <laughs> um, Winter is here. <laughs> Winter is very much here. Um, Oh. Hi, my name is Jacqueline. I have a question. If I cover a song, is there ever an instance where the artist, the original artist, might say, I don't want you to use that song? Like, is there yep. a risk? <laughs> yeah, that, that can happen a lot. Happened yeah, this morning. That's, that's actually, yeah, <laughs> that happens a lot. I was going to bring that up earlier. But um, yeah, basically, there's, there's uh, in the publishing world, there's sort of like approved lists of songs you know you think you can get cleared. Um, but ultimately, you can create awesome covers of songs and if an artist doesn't like your version they can be like oh we're just not going to approve the publishing and so you can't you just can't use that song it, it uh, yeah i mean the, i've worked on a few films where uh, it's kind of period music and clearing stuff for you know like blondie and stuff and they've re-recorded all their tracks because they want the master rights and you can you, you obviously clear the publishing but they want the the sound recording the new version. I have to say, it sounds like the original. You know, I think Super Tramp's doing it. There's a whole bunch of them. They're doing it now. EMF. It, it sounded day. like things are real, a big, big issue too. I'm working on a, a movie called Iron Woman, the Helen Reddy story. And of course, you know, the, the main actor needs to sound like Helen Reddy. And we've ha I had to go through the process with all the other publishers to make sure that, you know, this is a sound alike. There's also estates, so like, you know, an artist passed away and, and on their deathbed have said, we, I will not do films containing X, Y, Z. And you might make a cover and you, it might still be cleared by the publisher, but you get to the end and the estate will, will deny it. So always get approval from everyone before you even start, I think. Just curious because I know in the film business people get paid even if the product doesn't get made. So when when you're the process you're talking about of developing a trailer, like when you get hired to put a piece in, you're getting paid along the way even if your trailer nothing. It's all on spec. We we don't we don't get paid until it airs, but the trailer house will get paid whether they win or not. And same in music for films. Like if the film is just cut or doesn't ever go anywhere, or your music's cut out of it, you don't get paid for that. Typically, unless you can negotiate a kill fee or a demo fee for a custom score. Yeah, sorry to be repetitive on the similar line. Kristen, do you find it's difficult to motivate the composers around you to be pitching 
Yes. Uh, <laughs> and do you have like a rotating cast? I mean, I have, you know, my main teams. Um, we have hundreds of composers we work with um, in different genres. We have electronic producers, DJs, sound designers, rock artists, you know, classical orchestral writers, you know, it runs the gamut in terms of genre. And depending on the project, I draw from those sources. Um, so yeah, I have my main people I know deliver. That's number one, by the way, like we have some awesome creatives who write amazing songs, amazing music, and they can't deliver and we can't work with them. Like well, they, really well, they don't get feedback or something irritating, right? I mean, you know, I'm not going to go all into naming names and stuff, but like we've had this happen and I'm like, well, I like, just can't, we can't rely on you. We, it's our reputation also. We're signed up to deliver on this, you know? So, so yeah, we have our go-to teams and, and I, I always give them the option. I'm like, here's the deal. And do you want to do it? And they have a choice and they either say yes or no. Most of the time they say yes. If it's a big trailer or an ad or a big promo, they take the risk because it's worth it. And then if, if they can't, if it doesn't land, then that music is free and clear to be used elsewhere. So if it's very specific, like we did the promo for La Last Man Standing, which is like a new Fox reboot of that show. And it was like very much a script of what they gave us that they wanted us to write. And so in that instance, it's kind of harder to repurpose, but we could take that underscore track and license it out again and reuse it. So it doesn't just go to waste, but it doesn't land in that particular spot. I think this, this is just in general also for, for artists and, you know, I've, I've worked in this industry now for a long time and uh, it's the, the people that, you know, get to, get to a level that they're happy with are the people that really work hard um, and more so than ever now because music is everywhere and, um, you know, gone are the days of just sending an old cassette in demo. Those demos have to be sparkly. You know, the demos have got to be top quality now. Um, briefs and pitches that come in, you know, they've got to know and really, really think about what, what they're reading to and get the message across in their music. And it's a quick turnaround now too. I mean, some of these production houses, they, they'll send something through and, and they, they'll give you a time, you know, and it might come through at 9 a.m. and they'll want it at 4 p.m. I mean, that's how crazy Or an hour it's later. Yeah, I, I actually, I, I really agree. I think the biggest... Um thing for me when tr choosing a, which composers I work with, like in my inner circle, is speed. Mm. You know, like I've got composers that can turn stuff around and out or can turn an album out in 48 hours if they really want to. And those are the composers because to be honest, it kind of is a numbers game. You know, if you can triple your output, you are just gonna get more placements in the long, in the long run um, because your songs will get used. It might take five to 10 years, um, but you've just got to, get better at finishing them. I think that's what a lot of composers have problems with. Got to be a finisher. Um, do we have time for any more questions, guys, at the back, no? Well, in that case, can you give a big warm applause to Kristen, Vikram, and Gary? Thank you. Thank you very much.